uh, lobbied in one way or another on over 300 bills. Uh, we tracked hundreds more. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work um, that goes into lobbying the General Assembly, and uh, it can be very difficult. This was an especially strange year for the reasons that uh, Senator Golden just mentioned. Um, she's also right uh, to a large extent. We were very lucky um, at the way the, uh, the legislature recessed. There are a handful of very bad bills that were on the calendar ready to get passed. Um, and because of this uh, abrupt impasse, they didn't. Uh, but the legislature is coming back in September. And so uh, I think the bottom line is that a so-so session uh, may turn into a, a worse one uh, than we had hoped for. But having said that, I mean, there are a number of good bills that did pass. We're going to be discussing a few of them tonight. Um, there are a number of bad bills that passed, and we're going to be discussing a few of them tonight as well. I'd encourage you to visit our website where you can get more information about a lot more bills. I think we have maybe about 50 of the bills we lobbied on um, on our website, so you can learn more about that. This really is just a very, very s small snippet of, of what we're doing. Um, so. All right, thank you. Uh, well, I was just saying to Steve, this summary is so good, I think I can go home. <laughs> but uh, not to uh, give some, any editorial comment, I found this to be a very alarming bill. Um, some people described it as a bill that allows law enforcement access to your medicine cabinet. And that is not so far from the truth. Uh, just to summarize it, which I assume, to summarize it, this bill um, it went through some revisions, but ultimately, Attention, Kmart uh, uh, Ultimately, uh, this bill allows certain law enforcement agencies, primarily federal, also on the state level, um, uh, fraud, uh, Medicaid fraud, and uh, in fact, this bill was uh, put in by the Office of the Attorney General. Now, what this bill allows is access to the Department of Health, which, as an aside, is the state agency charged with protecting all our privacy, medical privacy. Um, it allows the Department of Health, which before this year um, has had a registry for controlled substances, so that uh, controlled substances come in, they're called different schedules, according to how addictive the medication is. So some of the things you think of automatically as uh, a controlled substance, morphine, Demerol, those kinds of things, of course, are on there, but so are things like you have a cough, you go to your doctor, it's pretty bad, he says, you know what, you need some cough medicine with coding. You're on the registry. now. To be fair, this registry does permit um, medical providers to take a look. They, they're in their offices. They have. They can gain access to it by computer to make sure that someone who has an office visit, who um, needs uh, some sort of a, a narcotic medication, for example, the doctor, if he so chooses or I think he's actually supposed to, but checks the registry just to make sure that this is not a patient getting into trouble with opiates. However, the understanding about the background of this bill is that it enabled law enforcement to find so-called pill mills, providers who are writing prescriptions for vast amounts of addictive medication without um, justification. Now, as I understand it, the Department of Health has the ability already to aggregate information about providers and to be able to say, you know, Dr. X is writing an inordinate number of prescriptions that it's kind of questionable. So you don't need this piece of legislation to move ahead with that. 
what would happen is law enforcement would go to a judge and get a search warrant. And that protects everybody's rights. It allows, um, it's fair to the patient, it's fair to the provider, and but, but what this bill is doing is it's saying, you know what, law enforcement, you don't need to get that search warrant anymore. All you need to do is have an open case. And I don't mean to be sarcastic. What do you need to have an open case? Take out a manila file folder and put a number? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what, what is required for that to occur so without going to a judge, without going to a search warrant, law enforcement, because of this bill, which PS has been signed into law by Governor Raimondo, it didn't just pass into law, it was signed into law. Now, law enforcement, if there's an open case, they have a suspicion, they can go to the Department of Health and gain access to your pharmaceutical records. Now, uh, when I was called by the Department of Health about this, and what they said was, well, you know, the director, now under, I, I think it was in a revision to the law, before it passed, the director can sort of say, uh-uh, no more, and pull the rug out. So that's protection for, for the public. Well, first of all, I'm uncomfortable with a law being written and passed on the basis of one individual. She's a nice lady, she's a smart lady, who knows how long she's staying in Rhode Island. So um, that was not very persuasive. The, uh, also, I believe a sunset provision was added, uh, 2023 if I remember correctly, and um, uh, that went along when the bill was passed. So the bill is now, as of I think January 1st will be law, and I'm hoping that in the next legislative session we can go back, I don't know how unrealistic that is, but to go back and do something about this because I feel that this is, and, and I represent people who have uh, mental health and substance use disorders, and I think as much as I would like to say there is no longer a stigma attached to those illnesses, unfortunately the reality is that there is, and to have that information so readily available, I think, is an outrage. So I'm hoping we can try to fix it in the next session. It's really a lot in it that I want. So, um, so automatic voter registration. We had a, a signing this morning. This was a, a lead bill of the Secretary of State's. Um, it was my bill and Representative Coughlin in the House. And essentially, you know, right now what we have in place is um, created by the Motor Voter Law. You, when you go to the DMV to um, get your license, they ask you if you want to be a registered voter. And that combined with the online voter registration, which um, ACLU and Common Cause and Secretary of State and I worked on last year, um, you know, we were able to um, streamline the electronic process, process behind the scenes about updating your information in your electronic file, as well as when you go to the DMV, that would automatically um, update the address and those kind of things. But those are all you know, steps that you proactively need to take in order to register to vote. And what we know is if you turn 18 and are a citizen and are registered to vote with no action on your own, you're more likely to vote. Um, we've seen this, it came from, the first state who did this was the state of Oregon. Uh, they had 200,000 people registered once they started this new automatic voter registration system, 200,000 new voters um, registered, and then their first election after that, 98,000 of those 200,000 voted. So this is a huge, and of those 98,000, that is disproportionately um, voters who are lower income, have less education, have less access, um, less likely to vote to begin with. So this is a really significant change and it will be a significant change for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, one thing I'm particularly proud of and certainly something that ACLU helped work on was ensuring that this isn't just tied to the DMV because the DMV, while it is the easiest place um, in terms of data access to make sure that you can uh, 
connect up the data to ensure that this person is 18 and a citizen and has the right to vote. Um, we have a lot of other data points that the government gets information about you. We have the health insurance exchange. Um, you know, you have, anytime you are accessing Medicaid benefits or SNAP benefits or any of those other benefits, um, we know stuff about you. And so ultimately, when we get to the point where the technology is there, with, when we pass this bill into law, um, it also says that when we have the technology available in all these other places, those will also be touch points that will ensure that people will be registered to vote. It's a huge way that we've removed a barrier to voting um, because as we know, our voting system is fraught with uh, barriers created to racism and classism and sexism. Um, and this is a way that we may ensure that everybody who has a voice is able to use it. Thank you. The next bill we're gonna hear about is uh, 38 Studios. And Justin says that's more. Hello everyone, thanks again for being here. So 38 Studios, I'm sure we're all very familiar with the failed video game company founded by Kurt Schilling. Our efforts continue five years after this company went bankrupt. Five years later, we're still looking for information and answers to the questions about how uh, the, the company went bankrupt, how the decision was made to give that company in 2012 a $75 million bond that it defaulted on. Uh, five years of efforts, uh, primarily by the ACLU, as well as a number of other open government advocates, including my organization, the New England First Amendment Coalition, to open up those records, give them to you, the public, so we can have a better understanding of, of what happened and, and how these decisions were made. Uh, the most recent legislation uh, would have uh, provided to the public, it would have forced the disclosure of a uh, number of records that were collected during the uh, investigation into the, the collapse of 38 studios, um, including those documents that were given to the state police as well as to the, to the AG, uh, the Attorney General. Uh, there was a separate effort as well, uh, and, and perhaps Stephen could speak more directly to this, um, to open up and disclose all of the records that were provided uh, in the grand jury investigation. Uh, but bigger picture here, uh, the legislation was uh, intended to give more information to uh, to you, the public, uh, residents of Rhode Island, to figure out just what happened and to make sure that it doesn't happen again because ultimately that's what it's all about, right? That's what uh, our Public Records Act, uh, the Access Public Records Act is for, is to provide this information, these records, so we have a better understanding of how our government's working, how decisions like signing off on the, the uh, $75 million uh, bond, how those decisions were made, and to make sure that those that made decisions that ultimately don't work out are held accountable and uh, better decisions are, are made in the future. Um, what happened with this legislation, it's actually quite interesting. Um, it, was, uh, it was supported uh, throughout both chambers. Uh, the, government, the governor was sent to, uh, ready to, to sign this legislation. Uh, but before it was signed into the law, the attorney general filed for an injunction, meaning uh, a, a yes to court to prevent the enforcement of this law that had yet to be signed. Uh, meaning before, before it even became a law, he was looking to, um, to uh, prevent the disclosure of these records. And, and that's where we stand right now. The legislation itself wasn't signed, uh, but we expect it will be soon, if not this legislation, then similar or the same legislation um, next session. And we look forward to working with the ACLU on uh, opposing that injunction and making sure that um, when that law does come into effect, that the records are disclosed and more information is provided to you on 38 Studios. ago to introduce and essentially what the bill in the first form would have done was get rid of um, juvenile life without parole. Um, there have been some Supreme Court uh, rulings that say that you, states can no longer automatically 
mandate a life without parole sentence for juveniles. Um, and there are a whole host of uh, organizations across the country from you know the American Medical Association, Psychological Association, Mental Health, um, to lawyers, to you know, kind of everyone who runs the gamut in terms of dealing with uh, children who are in the juvenile justice system. Talking about why that's a problem, why we should be treating juveniles differently, because they aren't fully formed adults, and the decisions they make, however lifelong those, the impacts of their actions might be, doesn't mean that the sentencing that goes with that should have a lifelong impact. We should assume that it is possible to, for a 16-year-old to re be rehabilitated, um, to recognize uh, what went wrong and get on a different life path um, and not keep them in prison for the rest of their life. So, um, you know, it was an amazing journey. I, uh, there's a national organization that works on this um, across the country, and I had attended a conference uh, of theirs in D.C. and saw firsthand these stories of people whose own children who had been uh, murdered um, sitting beside the person who, as a teenager, had murdered their children, talking about how they had worked together to change the laws in their state because they realized that there was no reason to throw away both those lives, that the first child had already died, and if the second one could make something of their life and get them a better place that was a better um, path for them. It was just, uh, it was really remarkable and uh, because of the Attorney General, um, it's a little theme here, um, <laughs> we were unable to pass that bill because the Attorney General didn't agree with removing that sentencing. So instead what we um, chose is a new pattern um, and we decided that we would introduce legislation that that um, required that juveniles sentenced to anything for longer than 15 years would have to come before the parole board at 15 years. Uh, so that does sentence in juvenile life without parole. It also actually changes um, a little bit if you were sentenced to something else with a much longer um, time frame, although it's, it's mainly a way to address life without parole. Uh, we were able to pass it in the Senate this year. Senator Metz um, took on the advocacy for that bill and we passed it in the Senate, um, but it did not end it. <laughs> Go anywhere in the House. Um, you know, and so this is, an, it, it's, it's one of the things that I think is um, so interesting out of the State House is there's not really a natural advocacy constituency outside of the public defender's office and um, organizations that work with youth and the ACLU to come up and fight on behalf of uh, people who have who are currently incarcerated um, and particularly those incarcerated as youth. Um, so it is, it is certainly important if that's an issue that resonates with you to please talk to your legislators about it. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about our juvenile justice system enough up at the General Assembly, and I think it's really important not only on this issue, but on a whole other ways that we need to look at the way we change our laws to ensure that youth are, have those opportunities ahead of them. The, uh, it's the Student Free Press Bill, and I'm really excited about this. Uh, uh, you know, this really, it actually, what it does is it gives um, student journalists uh, the freedom to investigate um, to follow on, you know, use investigative journalism to follow up on a story um, without fear of having being retaliated against by their administration or by the school system in any way. It also protects their mentors from helping them do so. And it's it's really interesting because I don't know if anybody saw there was a story in Kansas, um, some high school students who figure out I think she was a school superintendent principal. Um, had falsified her yeah. work history, um, you know, and the students kind of started down this path where they were doing a little investigation about her, and they did. Um, they got anxious, and the mentor said, "No, you know, you keep going. We're gonna, we're gonna figure out what this is. We're gonna write about it." And they were fully protected because this law exists in Kansas. Um, if this had been done in a different state without those protections, those kids could have. Um, you know, they could have been suspended, they could, any number of things could have happened to them that would have been uh, certainly 
find it difficult for them. And the flip side of this is these kids um, not only did something that was really important for that community, but they also really learned journalism in the process, right? And both those things are really needed right now. So, um, so it, was, it was such a delight to introduce this bill. I had introduced it last year um, at the request of a student at the med school who was active in the Providence Student Union and if anybody there's a Providence Student Union and a group of students um, in different high schools across the city of Providence that advocate for change within the administration. They've been particularly focused on um, documenting and reporting about infrastructure needs within the city schools. So when there's ceiling tiles falling on them or uh, mushrooms growing up through the um, cracks in the floor, which does exist in schools in Providence. Uh, you know, they're documenting and they're talking about it, and they wanted to be able to do it in a, from a journalistic standpoint um, without being fear that this would affect them negatively. So really happy. Um, Steve worked very closely with me to get this bill um, not only across the finish line, to be, but to be worded in a way that would fully address the concerns um, that we had, as well as to um, deal with some input from the Providence School Department. So very thankful about that. And that bill was passed and signed by the governor. The only thing I would add is uh, how appreciative I am, my organization is for the efforts of uh, Senator Golden and our colleagues, as well as uh, Stephen here at the ACLU, this this was a, a great success. Uh, it, it really allows students to practice journalism in a way that I think we all would want them to, and to be able to write stories uh, about drug use in schools, uh, about school budgets, about the real issues that are affecting these students every single day, and to have them report them and to write about them uh, and, and not fear any punishment from their administration. Uh, I think given the, the current you know, political climate nationally, uh, many of us are concerned about the state of journalism or access to information. Well, uh, laws like this uh, protect those student journalists, our future investigative reporters, our future Pulitzer Prize winners, those that we're gonna be counting on in the years to come to inform us uh, about what's going on. And uh, I can't overstate just how important this bill is and what a uh, successful effort it was uh, on behalf of the Senator and the ACLU. Uh, the, the next issue is uh, justice, reinvent, justice reinvestment, and I notice a pattern here. All the bills I'm talking about are very disappointing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so to give a little background, justice reinvestment um, is a concept that is, has been sweeping the country for a number of years. It's the idea of really looking at criminal justice in a smart way as opposed to just a punitive way. And uh, across the country in blue states and lots of red states, uh, criminal justice reform is being passed under this, uh, under this title. Um, a lot of red states are recognizing that the current criminal justice system is extremely expensive and doesn't really work, and so that's the way that they, many of them, approach it. But whatever the reason, um, it's an extremely important discussion that's been going on with some very positive results. Um, here in Rhode Island, uh, about three years ago, Governor Raimondo um, created a, a Justice Reinvestment Task Force. Um, she got uh, the Council of State Governments, which is this big national organization that helps state legislatures work on, on various issues, uh, to come in, take a very close and detailed look at the state's criminal justice system in all its aspects, sentencing, parole, probation, um, judicial sentencing and so on, um, they convened a huge task force um, with just about every stakeholder you can imagine to sit down and try to work something out. Um, they met many times and they ended up with um, a legislative package that got introduced last year uh, in the Senate and the House. Um, when it got introduced, 
not surprisingly, in light of this very broad group that worked on it, um, there was a lot of compromise. Uh, the bill got watered down quite a bit, but it still was a, a significant effort uh, in terms of trying to deal with some of the criminal justice issues that plague Rhode Island. We have the highest probation rate in the country. Um, uh, people are on probation for very long periods of time and can easily be sent back to prison for very minor things that aren't even criminal offenses. So the bills try to address that, address diversion, uh, many, many different things. Uh, the Senate passed the bill uh, last year. There were six, six bills altogether making up this package. Uh, the Senate passed them very early in the session last year, uh, and it just hung around the House Judiciary Committee for months. Um, and then at the very end of the session, there was lots of um, back and forth going on between the House and Senate leadership uh, about trying to get these bills out of House committee and become law. Um, and at the very end, that did not happen. Um, it had been a, pr a priority of then Senate President Teresa Paiva Weed um, uh, to try to get these bills passed and she was visibly upset at the very end of the session last year when she got the news of the House was not going to pass them. Um, that didn't deter the Senate from coming back this year um, with a few very minor changes. Once again, very early in the session, either January or February, the Senate once again passed the package, gave it to the House Judiciary Committee, and once again, months went by, nothing going on. Uh, and then uh, in the afternoon of what we all thought was the last day of the session, um, uh, House Judiciary Committee posted these bills for a hearing and uh, for a vote, not a hearing. And um, you know, a lot of us were very excited. Um, you know, we thought this is what almost happened a, a year earlier, um, and it was finally going to happen as part of some deal or whatever. Um, but what, hap what happened as a number of us were sitting there in the room as the committee considered these bills was that every one of them had been amended. Um, and nobody on the committee had seen the amendments. Um, you could probably count on one hand the number of people who knew what was actually in these revised bills. Um, and unfortunately, after we had a chance to look at them, um, it was really very disturbing because as I said, every bill had been amended, and they've been weakened uh, sometimes in very significant ways. Um, some of the changes were minor, but some of them really undercut uh, a lot of the key provisions um, that were part of this, uh, this justice reinvestment uh, package. Um, we were saved by the bell um, because of, the committee had uh, voted on a few of these revised bills, and then the bell rang when everybody went up to the House floor and learned that um, they were leaving for the foreseeable future. Um, and we are now uh, hoping to use the time between now and when the legislature comes back in September to try to undo um, what, uh, what these revised bills do. Um, I'm hoping that the Senate will stand firm and say, you know, this is, this is the compromise that people agreed to. We need to pass the bill these way, uh, this way. Um, you know, the one thing I hate to see is bills as they've been amended, uh, at least for the moment, to pass and to have people claim they we now have justice reinvestment in Rhode Island um, because that would be um, that would simply not be true. And I'm particularly concerned that if bills that are so weak as they are now pass. It's going to be a very long time before the legislature takes up the issue again. They're going to say, you know, back in 2017, we, we did justice reinvestment. Don't bother us with that issue for another decade. So this is something that's ongoing. Uh, it's by no means um, a decided issue. Uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, convince the Senate to stay strong. And if, if there is an agreement, um, we hope that they'll just let the bills die and we can start again uh, in January and hopefully get the strong bills that the Senate, uh, Senate has been pushing for the last two years.